heading out in the moonlight. Andrew Konchek often spends 80 hours a week on the water, sometimes more. It is grueling work, and it shapes his politics. I'm Republican. Uh, you know, it's they're, they're more for the working man. Fishing boats have filled this harbor for 400 years. It is a proud but struggling industry, a blue-collar craft where the workers feel ignored by the regulators who set the rules and by the politicians who now want to line the coast with wind turbines. That's going to completely destroy our fishing industry. And so your political decisions are based on? My livelihood. The men we met along these docks are not climate deniers. The water is warmer, the storms wilder, the fish different. But they say the people deciding what to do about it don't ask those who live it every day. I don't think a politician will ever understand what I do for work unless they come on the boat with me and then maybe they'll understand. Any of them ever offer to come on the boat? <laughs> no, no. Distrust and disaffection are easy to find here. I mean, the middle class, the working class, fishermen, all of us, we, we are struggling in this economy. Anger at traditional politicians drew Lucas Raymond to Donald Trump back in 2016. He sees a new insurgent in the 2024 presidential field. I am extremely likely to vote for Robert Kennedy, yes. Why? He is willing to state that we should not blindly trust corporations or our government. And I think he staunchly believes in caring for our environment. Raymond says many Republican-leaning friends feel the same way. My crewmate sent me his interview with Joe Rogan, and I started listening to him. Um, and I found many things about him pretty impressive. Two things to know about me. I love craft beer, and I obsess about political math. There you go. How choices like Raymond's could impact not only the primary, but also the vote here next November. Stanley Tremblay shares Raymond's disgust with politics as usual. 2016, Clinton Trump. I wanted neither. I didn't vote for either of them. But third party? Third party. Gary Johnson, I assume. Um, 2020, Biden, Trump. Neither. Third party. What are you going to do now? What if you get Biden, Trump again? Probably not vote. Tremblay's father was a Vietnam veteran. His brewery is in an old fire station, and signs of service are everywhere. He wants to believe, but he just can't right now. We need to get the old out and bring new in and reinvigorate what hopefully is uh, a better United States. Tremblay would never vote Trump, so you could argue his sitting out the primary helps the former president. Pete Burdett's change of heart hurts Trump. National security is uh, the number one thing that uh, any president would need to take precedence over everything else because you don't have an economy if you don't have a country. Burdett served 21 years in the Navy as a helicopter pilot and a flight instructor. Newcomer Trump won him over in 2016. He was a pretty smart guy, and I had met him personally. But Burdett says Trump 2024 is not Trump 2016. He's not focusing on the issues going forward. He seems to be focusing on the issues of the past. I'm done with the past. Nikki Haley is Burdett's choice this time. Still, signs of Trump's New Hampshire advantage are easy to find. It's definitely very much pro-Donald Trump uh, from what I see here on the grassroots, on the ground. But Natalia Orlando adds a caveat worth keeping an eye on. I personally don't think that he's as strong as he was in 2016. I have people who argue with me about that and tell me I'm wrong and get mad that I'm saying this, but I'm going to be honest and say, no, I don't see it. Andrew Konchek agrees. Then compared to now, same, different, less, more? I think it'd be less now because all the legal cases and yeah, it did, it did impact him around here. Like in 2016 though, Konchek sees Trump as the best catch in another crowded GOP field. Donald Trump as of right now, but I'm gonna keep it open so that I can make an educated decision. Trump would be first, DeSantis second, yes. Konchek may have to catch the second GOP debate offshore on satellite TV, but fishing season will be on winter break when the primary is held early next year. John King joins us now with his trusty sidekick, the CNN Magic Wall. So you hear New Hampshire voters, you hear Iowa voters, they're not always in lockstep. What does history tell us? 
Uh, that's why this is so interesting, Anderson. This is the 2016 map. Remember, Donald Trump's first win and came in New Hampshire. You just heard the voters there saying he's got a pretty healthy lead there. They all believe that, even the voters who are not with him at the moment, right? Then Iowa, Ted Cruz won it back in 2016. Uh, but Donald Trump, we were there just last month, the month before. Donald Trump's very strong there now. And yet these states are so different. How is Donald Trump ahead in these two states? Look at this. This is the 2016. Forgive me for turning my back. This is the 2016 primary and caucus election. Look how different. Iowa, 79 percent of the voters were Republicans. In New Hampshire, that's only 59 percent because only 20 percent in Iowa independents. Look at that. More than four in 10 voters in the New Hampshire primary back in 2016 and likely again this time around are independents. Look at the difference ideologically. 40 percent of the Iowa voters in 2016, very conservative. New Hampshire, only 26 percent. Evangelical Christians, really easy to find in Iowa. And guess what? Of the electorate in the caucuses last time, more than six in 10. Hard to find in New Hampshire, only a quarter. And yet, as of today, look how different these two states' electorate, right? Very different electorate, very different in terms of their ideology, and yet Donald Trump's way ahead in both states, which makes him the faraway frontrunner. Not impossible to beat, but very, very hard to beat. Did you get a grasp on the level of excitement that exists for Trump in New Hampshire this time? If you listen, what was interesting is there's no question Trump has a lead. And everybody, again, even the people in our forum think it's a pretty sizable lead. But it was so interesting. The biggest takeaway for me, the biggest takeaway was the disillusionment across the board, which is why some Republicans are going even to Robert F. Kennedy Jr. But among Trump voters, so many of them, Anderson said, I'm with him now, but it's not like 2015. It's not as exciting as early 2016. And some of them said, as we get closer to the primary, they haven't set the date yet, but it'll be probably in January, that if DeSantis, they most mentioned DeSantis, but if somebody else was surging, maybe they'd reconsider. So Trump has a big lead now. Make no mistake about that. Take nothing I say to make you think Trump's not way ahead, but you do sense some vulnerabilities. The question is, in a crowded field, can anybody take advantage of it? We have lived that before. John, Stanley's liquid therapy bar looked like a lot of fun. How was the craft beer? Uh, it was awesome, Anderson, to come along. <laughs> come along on the next trip. I would but, like you to. Know, I, I'm laughing about it, but, but Stanley Tremblay is actually really fascinating to me as someone who's done this. This is my 10th presidential campaign. Dad, Vietnam veteran, cares about his community, votes in local elections, has the local officials into his pub, won't vote in national politics because he's disgusted. Mm. That's a problem. 